pleasant evening to you all wherever we find ourselves this evening. We want to thank God for yet another opportunity to be gathered here. I welcome uh, the six of us who have joined us this evening. Um, as we proceed, as usual, we know other family, friends, and uh, other members who also join us. Tonight, we shall be looking at the change in sacrifice. The change in sacrifice. What do we mean by the change in sacrifice? Maybe you would want to remind a friend, a sister, a brother, a colleague at work that we are here live. Let's come and uh, do this all together. Sorry, there was a call that was coming through. So let's do this together. Um, the changing wine sacrifice. So as usual, we begin with a prayer. Let's bring ourselves before the Lord. We have prayed so many times, maybe in the course of the day, from morning, in the afternoon, and now. Even some few minutes ago before this session, live session, you might have prayed. But because we are bringing ourselves before the Lord who sheds his blood for us, let us pray once again. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, we thank you for another moment to be gathered here. You bring us to understand that which you have already done for us and that which you are accomplishing, which human eyes have not yet seen because of our limitedness. Tonight, we pray as you offer us this gracious opportunity. Set my humanity aside that every word that comes from me based on what you have revealed through your scripture our understanding and the inspiration of the holy spirit which you give us and our humility to present to your children that which you want them to hear we may lead these beautiful souls to you for such is your will Bless those who are gathered now. Bless those who come to join us later. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so let me acknowledge those who are here with us. I've seen some messages so that we go back. Um, are they today? No. Okay. These are all the messages who are here with us today. Okay. Aha. So we have... Uh, okay. Good evening, Franca Bo. Good evening. Okay. That is today. So we have Francesca Bo, our sister. Oh, our lovely sister Francesca. Our lovely sister Juliana Dianco from UK. Francesca is in Ghana. Juliana, our sister, dear sister Juliana is in the UK. Ma Cecilia Mtadu is at Kumasi K and UST. said, good evening, Father. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. We have our brother, Ohineba Siang, here in Italy. Uh, we have our dear sister Charlotte all the way from the US of A. Uh, her time is a little bit different, but that notwithstanding, she's here with us. You see how serious people take their faith. Our mother, Veronica Dubro Bay, is also here with us. Our brother, Joseph Osu Dubik, joins us from Ghana. Ma Vero is in Ghana. Our sister, Rita Sa, is all the way from Cape Coast in Ghana, joining us. Our dear sister, Angela, is here in Italy with us. Ma Agatha is from the US of A. Uh, Gideon is in Kumasi. He says hi. Our dear sister Sophia says good evening. Uh, um, yeah, did Sophia Ankara. That's our dear sister all the way from Ghana. He says good evening, everyone. Uh, then who again? Our dear sister Mary Christa says good evening, Father. Good evening to you all. It's good you exchange the greetings among ourselves, dear beautiful souls, to me and to one another. The changing sacrifice. You would have loved to invite thousands of people for this presentation. 
because I'm bringing you things you've never heard before. So wow, bring them on board, bring them on board. You see, our focus since the beginning of Sunday has been the Hey Kainei Diafeke, the New Testament in his blood, in the blood of Christ. I've taken you to St. Louis Gospel, chapter 22, 20, and I've told you, Today, what does the changing sacrifice implies? I've told you that our Christian faith has its roots in Judaism. And I explain why it has its roots in Judaism, because what we celebrated, the Passover, the Christian Passover, what today people want to call Easter, which is a word that has been changed. But the real word that we say, the Peshach, the passing over, the Passover, is coming from the Old Testament the feast of our brothers and sisters, the Jews. Till today they celebrated, the, the Jews, they celebrated it in the first month of Aviv. Go and read Exodus 12. You look at it, the first month Aviv represented the year or the grain, the year of the grain, when uh, maybe um, the maize sprouts, you see, the year of the, of the, of the maize, Aviv, that is the meaning. So it was an agricultural feast. It initiated the agricultural festival, the beginning of harvest. That was the man. The reason why it will later be called Nizan, you told us of you have heard the, the 14th day of Nizan. S I sorry, N I S A N. These days people mention more Nizan than Aviv because when they went to Babylon. They picked the Babylonian name for that month. So they started celebrating as the 14th Nizan. But whether Aviv or Nizan is the same month, the same month of the year of the Jewish calendar. That was the month that began. Today we're going to look at the biblical evidence. It's not something that I'm speaking from my own mind. It's a wise father. It show us the evidence. So that is what we say. Our faith has its roots in Judaism. And I've told you the founder was a Jew. Jesus was not Ghanaian, was not an American, he was a Jew. Then certain elements that today we have Christianized, we celebrate, are also have its offshoots in Judaism. And I've told you the greatest feast in the Christian calendar is the feast of Passover. Today, Christians want to call it Easter. The reason why it's called Easter, we will have some another time to look at it. But today, let's look at why it is called Passover. It's coming from the Old Testament. So if it is the Passover, where do we first hear of the Passover? Has it changed? Yes, it has changed because in the New Covenant, New Testament, it is not as it was celebrated. It is an enactment of the Passover, but it is different. Some of the elements have been retained. Some of the elements have changed. Why have elements been retained? Why have elements been changed? That is the changing wine sacrifice. So quickly, if your scriptures are with you, can we move all of us quickly to Exodus? Let's look at what God told the people in Israel. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, my Bible tonight, these references are from the New International Version. So if the words are different, so Father, which Bible are you reading from? So depending on your version, but tonight I've chosen New International Version. Eh? So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month of the year, of your year. Which month? For the Hebrews, it was called Aviv, but it is spelled A-B-I-B. -B, and you put a bar under the first B, so you pronounce that V, Aviv, or Aviv. That is the month. Later, after the deportation, when they went to Babylon, they will come to call it Nisan because the Babylonians called this month Nisan. Then what is God telling the people this month? Tell the whole community of Israel that on the third day of this month, Aviv, now Nisan, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household, one lamb for each household. Look at what is going to happen to the animals. The animals you choose, sorry, I said there, but it should be the animals. Let me correct it quickly, sorry. Um, so the animals you choose, not hay. So the animals, 
the animals you choose must be one year old, year old male without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats, Exodus 205. This is the instruction. The first month, which is the agricultural festival, take a lamb unblemished without defect from the goats or the sheep, a household, each lamb, slaughter it, put some of the blood in a container bowl and mark the houses where you live in Goshen, the doorpost, you see, when the door, we have the post like this, the left and the right, then the lintel, the top. So mark it, the tops of the door frames of the houses where you eat the lambs, where you are eating, mark it. This was the instruction. Pay attention. He is going to tell them this feast when you read from Exodus 12 onwards. He will tell them the feast of unleavened bread. That is the agricultural festival. Remember, if Israel is now going to eat the unleavened bread, it tells you that now it is cultivating. This feast where they are to kill animals means that they are pastors, they are rearing animals. If you don't have animals, why will God command you to sacrifice? Where are they going to procure the lambs? They were pastors. They had the lambs, they had the animals to sacrifice. The feast of the unleavened bread, however, which began, it was the feast that initiated the feast of weeks, so that 50 days later, they were going to celebrate the Feast of Weeks, which now we Christians call the Pentecost. So it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread that marked, that marked the beginning of the seven-week period. Before the 50 days come, there should be a festival that initiates, begins the 50 days. And that festival was called the Festival of Unleavened Bread. It was one of the festival of pilgrimages. There are three festivals of pilgrimages. Every year, every Jew was to go to Jerusalem three times on this feast. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, what we call Pentecost, and the later feast which was celebrated in a time where we call autumn, the Feast of Tabernacles. These were the three feasts that every Jew had to be in Jerusalem. But today, what I'm telling you, drawing your attention to is, Pay attention. In Egypt, where they are celebrating the Passover for the first time, have you heard why? Say no, Father. All of us, let's say no. No, Father. There is no mention of why. What do we hear? It is the eating of a lamb meat that should be roasted. That meat was not to be boiled. God instructed them, you must roast it. But the elements of this feast that I want to draw your attention to is the blood of the lamb that will be placed on the doorpost and the lentils so that when the angel of God was passing, in seeing the blood, he was going to jump over. He was going to redeem. He was going to exempt. These are terms used to describe the action of God when he passed over the houses of the Israelites. The angel seeing the blood was going to jump over was going to redeem, was going to exempt the people of Israel because there was blood, the blood of the lamb that which they have eaten. Look at, they will eat before the effects of the blood will work on their behalf. So when you come to the New Testament, the apostles, the disciples who eat before the effects of the blood, the passing over of Jesus on the cross. Hey, amen, say beautiful, now scripture is. So eat the animal apply the blood on the doors and lentils and the angel of destruction will pass on. Sacrifice it, eat it, roast it, then apply the blood on the doors and lentils. What I'm telling you tonight, what we are treating tonight is what you call the changing wine sacrifice. If our feast, the greatest feast, Easter, what you call it, but I want to use the term Passover, Peshach, has its roots in the first Passover in Exodus 12, 
Why is it that we, what we are celebrating, we have bread and wine that is consecrated to become the body and blood of Christ. But in the Old Testament, there is only the mention of unleavened bread. The bread is there, so we have no problem. And there is meat. There is no mention of wine. In fact, when you study scripture, you realize that in the Old Testament, yeah, the times where the people drank wine were during engagement, what we call engagement, when a girl was betrothed, or wedding celebrations, or um, how do you call it, some great feast. The occasions where they drank wine were these moments, weddings, engagements, certain great feasts. Ordinarily, if they took wine, they took wine daily for daily purposes, for medicinal reasons, therapeutic reasons. But wine with, was taken, was drunk during this great feast. Why is it that in this feast that commemorates the first Passover, there is no wine, but we Christians, you Catholics are saying that, oh, your Christ, uh, your mass, you are using bread and wine. When in the Old Testament that you say your sacrifice picks its roots from, there is no mention of wine. That is where we are leading you to. What is our focus in this month? The precious blood of the Lamb. The precious blood of the Lamb, that is Jesus Christ. But we are looking at it in the context of the new covenant, the Novum Testamentum, the He Kinediateke, in the context of a table meal. In this table meal, the Passover, for the first time in Exodus 12, there is no mention of wine. Father Cecilia, bring us to understand why wine entered the picture. Who brought in the idea of wine? If in the Passover in Exodus 12, God himself, Yahweh, does not ask the people of Israel to take wine, but it is meat of the lamb, bitter herbs, and bread, unleavened bread. Why does the wine come in? Where does it come from? You see, that's why we blame you Catholics. Hey, wait, wait, don't blame us. It is Jesus that is bringing it in and changing it. That's where I want to lead you to. You see, there are certain things that scripture doesn't say it explicitly, but we deduce from it. I'm not saying that what I'm saying tonight is I'm deducing from scripture. There are certain elements too. You don't find it in what we call the Old Testament, the scripture of our brothers and sisters, the Jews, and the New Testament, our scripture. But together, it is our scripture too. But I'm giving you this distinction because there are Christian groups today that refuse or refute the Old Testament. Why? Such Christian groups, most of them are coming from Marcion. Who was Marcion? Marcion is spelled M-A-R-C-I-O-N. Marcion was treated as a heretic. Marcion said his, his heresy was known as Marcionism. Marcionism. What was Marcionism? Marcionism in, in heresy, Marcion stated that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament because the God of the Old Testament is wicked. He's killing people. He's asking Israel to kill the Canaanites, to kill the Philistines. So the image of God presented in the Old Testament is a wicked God. He's different from the God of the New Testament. But the church insisted that the God we read about in the Old Testament is the God we read about in the New Testament. So because of this idea of God presented by Marcion, Christian groups who, <laughs> who have Marcion as the founder today reject the Old Testament because they don't know how to interpret the Old Testament. There are certain passages in the Old Testament without the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, without understanding the culture of our brothers and sisters, the Jews, you will not understand the New Testament. So if somebody tells you, oh, the Jews are lost, they are lost, tell that person he's a liar. The Jews are not lost. They will be saved by God. Go and read what Paul writes in his letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 10, 11, 12, and 13. Chapters 11, 12, and 13 especially. The disobedience of the Jews has brought in the pagans, us. And you think that if their disobedience brought us, the pagans, what would their obedience be? God will redeem the Jews. So if somebody tells you the Jews are lost, listen to me and listen clearly. Father Louis Cecilia Dupoku is saying that the Jews are not lost. How will God save them? I'm not God, but I, 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 so I wouldn't say how. I wouldn't say how. If you want to understand this clearly, spend time 
or if we have after month of July, let's take time to study Paul's letter to the Romans, especially chapter 10, 11, and 13. You understand what Paul wrote there. Let's come back to the idea of the wine. So I've told you in the past over there is no mention of wine, only unleavened bread, only meat and bitter herbs. Then, in the fourth century before Christ, there's a Jewish document. You see, the documents that we call Old Testament, New Testament. But between the Old Testament and the New, today we have discovered a large number of literature documents that, of course, they are not canonized. That is, we don't read in the Bible, but they existed at the same time when the Old Testament and the New Testament was being combined. We call these documents the second century literature. One of these documents is called the Book of Jubilees. From chapters 38, 39, 40, there is the mention of the Jews taking wine at certain feast. And that is where we talk about the four cups. Yesterday, I hinted at the four cups because when we read uh, first, St. Paul's first Corinthians, letter to the first Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16, I told you that Paul says, the cup of blessing that we bless. And I made mention, only a little reference to the third cup. But there were four cups. The Jews at their feast drank from four cups. What does these four cups mean? From the Jewish literature, this is not in the scripture. But I'm telling you to understand some of these things, we need to know, go back to what our brothers and sisters, the Jews do, and bring it to our celebration now. So why were they using four cups? We are not using four cups. We use only one cup. Times when you see four cups on the altar, it means that the celebration is big. There are so many people. So you bring about four, five, six, seven, ten chalices because there are a large number of people. Even in that, the liturgy explains to us that there should be only one big chalice and later it will be poured in all the chalices that are there. We shouldn't fill all the chalices. The church has a reason for that. That will be another time. Because of the book of this talk about the kind of wine the book of Jubilees. And I'm talking about the four cups. What does the four cups represent? According to the Jewish literature, they've given four uh, interpret they have given two interpretations to the four cups. The first one is in the scripture. The second one is even in the scripture. Both are in the scripture, the interpretation, by Jewish interpretations. So I'm taking you to Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 to 7. The Jews are brothers and sisters use these verbs, the action of God, to explain the four cups. The second explanation we'll read in Daniel chapter 7, the four kingdoms that must appear before the total and final liberation of the people of Israel. Pay attention. Father Cecilia is saying that in the beginning, Exodus 12, when God established the Passover for Israel, there was no drinking of blood. There was no drinking of wine. It is only the eating of meat, lambs, the eating of bitter herbs, and eating of unleavened bread. Bread, leaves, and meat. What we are celebrating as the new Passover, rather, we are bread and wine. So where did the wine come in? When in the Old Testament, first Passover, there is no wine. I'm telling you that what we are celebrating now, celebrating now, it is the new covenant. It's different from the old. It is coming from the old, but it is different. It's like the way we dress. Our dressing comes a little bit from the Romans, but it is different. It is different. It's not everything that is the same as that. So let's come back to the idea of the four cups. I'm taking you to Exodus chapter 6, verse 6 to 7, to explain the four ways they use to explain the four cups. The first blessing on the first cup is known as the kiddush. They thank God for the blessing. I told you yesterday what they have received. The second blessing, before that, the child in the family will ask, Daddy, what are we celebrating? And the father will tell them, our father's Abraham was a wandering Aramean. He was a sojourner. Then we appeared in Egypt. We became slaves. Then with an outstretched arm, God redeemed us. That is before the second, uh, the second cup. Then the third cup, that which St. Paul makes reference to, after the meal, they take the second and the third cup. After they are eating, they take the third cup. And the final and the fourth cup is the final blessing. 
is the final blessing. So these are the four cups, the meaning, the words they use to explain the four cups. Look at the verbs there. Say to the Israelites, I am the Lord and I will bring you. The first verb is bring. So over the first cup, it is God bringing his people from the yoke of the Egyptians. Then the second verb is I will free you. So it is God bringing the first cup, God freeing the second cup. The third cup is I will redeem you with an strength arm and I will take you as my own people. Friends, pay attention to the four verbs. You can call them synonyms. The Lord said, I will bring you out. The second one is, I will free you. Bringing or freeing is the same. Not, sorry, assimilar. I shouldn't use the word same, sorry, assimilar. So God is saying that he is telling the people of Israel, what I am giving you, these cups represent God bringing his people out of yoke. God freeing them. Friends, scripture is beautiful. You need time to study the word of God. God redeeming his people, God taking them. So I'll bring you, I'll free you, I'll redeem you, I will take you. These four words symbolize the four cups. This is the Jewish interpretation of their four cups. I'm not saying it's Christian because we are not using four cups. This is the meaning our brothers and sisters give to their four cups. And I'm telling you why wine has entered into the, situ- the picture now. Because in the beginning, there was no wine. It was bread, meat, and bitter herbs. If the cups have entered, this is the meaning of the cups. They are using it to represent, symbolize what God has done on their behalf. I'll bring you, I'll redeem you, I'll free you, and I'll take you. The next explanation is in Daniel 7. The four kingdoms that Daniel sees in the vision. He said... These four cups represent these four kingdoms that must come before God's final redemption of his people. What do you see about the kingdoms? Or what does these kingdoms do? You know that these kingdoms are the kingdoms that maltreat Israel in one way or the other. They will dominate Israel. So in the drinking of the cup, what do they call to mind? They call to mind the pains, the sufferings that they go through. So it's beautiful, both interpretations. The first interpretation in Exodus, in the drinking of the wine, they recall God's redemption, what is in, what God has done on their behalf. In the second interpretation in Daniel 7, concerning the four kingdoms, they remember the sufferings, the pains, these four kingdoms have put them through. Friends, the Old Testament in that Passover, there's no mention of wine. It is in the New Testamental times, that is, before the New Testament, the time between the old and the new that we read from the book of Jubilees. But before the Jews themselves are changing the Passover, giving a new meaning into it, hey, do you know that the greatest king in Israel brought some ramifications into their celebration. Who is that great king? He's called David. What ramification changes did David bring to the celebration? Open your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. In the feast of the Passover, what do we hear? We hear only about eating of the lamb, eating of bread and herbs. David is going to add a different aspect to the celebration, what we do today. Singing, he will appoint musicians. So in Jesus' last supper, they will sing. Where did they pick the hymn they're singing from? They learned from David. So let's go to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 1 to 7. It's beautiful, it's beautiful. Here we are. David is changing the Jewish celebration. No wonder the son of David, a descendant of David, Jesus in the New Testament, will also change the covenant and it will become a new covenant in his blood. First Chronicles 16, the first three verses. After David had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, you see, the burnt offerings, let me explain the burnt and fellowship offerings to you in Leviticus. 
in the burnt offering, Holocaust, everything was given to God. Nothing was taken. Nothing came to anybody. In the fellowship offering, however, part of the animal was offered to God and part was those who were offering also enjoyed it. So it is called a, a communion offering or a fellowship offering. Man eating with God. So even here, you see that the first sacrifice, everything was given, the burnt offering, completely to God. And in the fellowship offering, they gave part to God and they ate part. Man eating with God. In the New Testament, Jesus, God, will be eating with men. But pay attention to what David did. And that is the most beautiful thing. After he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Hey, why is David blessing them when it is the duty of a priest to be blessing the people? David the king is blessing people when it is the duty of the priest. Look at the role David is assuming here. It is a prefiguration of that descendant of David who will be a priest, not like David, because David was not a priest, but a priest in the order of Melchizedek to institute this new sacrifice. So listen, in verse 3, what did David give them? David gave them a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins. Raisins. Some have said that beside the loaf of bread, the cake of raisins, you could get wine from the raisins. After David had done that, so look at what David did. David is bringing the people to eat with God. As God invited the 70 elders to dine with him in the book of Deuteronomy. Now David is bringing the whole community to also partake in the meal with God. And after, look at, David is the only one who changes the celebration. He is bringing music into it. First, it was only the eating of bread, the eating of uh, herbs, and the eating of meat. David appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark, to thank God and to praise the Lord. Look at the instruments they were using. And they were to play the lyre, the harps, and Asaph was to sound the symbols. Who is changing this? It is not Saul. Saul was the first king. He did not change that celebration. It is David because it will be the descendant of David, Jesus, to change the feast once and for all. If Saul had changed this, we wouldn't have been here because Jesus is not the descendant of Saul. He's rather a descendant of David. What has Jesus done for us now? Now let us come to the Gospels. Friends, this is the process we've done. The Passover, there is no mention of wine. Jesus um, David, who is the king, and oh, today acts as a priest, will rather start changing the celebration, bringing in music, bringing in the people to dine with God. And in the, in the intertestual times, intertestament, sorry, in the intertestamental time, that is between the Old and New Testament, I've told you that in the book of Jubilees, it is not in the Bible, eh? the book of Jubilees is one of the documents that came out during that period. In chapters 38, 39, 40, we read of the four cups. And I've told you why the Jews took the four cups using Exodus 6, 6 to 7, and Daniel 7 to explain. In the whole of the New Testament, there is no celebration, whether the celebration they came, the Passover feast they came to celebrate, there is no mention of the consummation of wine till Jesus' feast, the last supper, that which we call the last supper, what we read in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, or what John, uh, sorry, what uh, St. Paul presents to us in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. And it is those instances that for the first time in the New Testament, we see that a meal, a feast, that is like the Passover of old, wine is added in the new dispensation. The aspects of wine that I talked about, the book of Jubilees, it is not a book in the New Testament. So you can't call it a New Testament documentation. In the New Testament, the first time in the Passover feast, wine is added, is the feast Jesus celebrates before he gives himself on the cross. Now you understand why today's topic is the changing wine sacrifice. Changing wine sacrifice. Are you here with me? I hope I'm not confusing you. 
and I hope you are loving and enjoying this. Dearly beloved, this is what God has done for us. And we need to remember it. Do this in memory of me, Zikaru. What should be our prayer tonight? See, before we pray, let me bring you some arguments. Those who argue that, oh, whatever he's saying is not from the scripture, they will come back to say it. But I keep telling you that their sources are not rather scriptural. Those who say sola scriptura alone, when it comes to this explanation considering the Eucharist, they fall flat. Because they'll tell you that it is not literal. Everything is figurative or metaphorical when it points to the reality. The question you have to ask them that. So Jesus didn't know what he was saying. Why did he say, this is my body? At the last supper, he said, take. When he has blessed, he said he broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take this. This is my body. Why didn't Jesus say, when he, 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 he blessed the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take this. This is the bread that I'm giving to you like the bread your fathers ate. Jesus could have said that. He said, take, this is my body. This is my body. Take, this is my blood. This is my blood. They knew the change in wine sacrifice. Arguments are, oh, the cups, the chalice, you see? The chalice is the cup that you put the wine in. So, oh, the golden cups you are using today and how your priest vest dress with all these dressing is not how Jesus did it. It's not in the Bible. This is anachronistic. How do you expect our dressing today to be like that of Jesus? Then you expect that to be wearing Lawrence sandals or even to be going barefooted. If your argument is we are using chalices and cups that are different from maybe what Jesus is you because maybe Jesus' time, they have maybe they might have used earthenware chalices. That is a cup that were made from uh, from 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 mud, from clay, sorry, from clay. And we are using rather chalices that are made from silver or bronze or brass. So you say, no, 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 no. The chalices you are using is not the same as Jesus used. So what you are celebrating is idolatry. It's coming from the Romans. And even now, people can't even distinguish Romans as people from Rome and Roman Catholicism because the head of the church is in Rome. It's like somebody telling you, oh, the first president of Ghana was not communicating. They didn't have means of communication. Somebody said, who told you they didn't have means of communication? This person who is a modern Ghanaian who is saying this, is saying that because he says in his own view, Nkrumah was not using iPhone 14 Pro Max. So because Nkrumah was not using iPhone 14 Pro Max, he was not communicating. Who told you? They were communicating, but their means of communication has been developed from that time till now. So the disciples, Jesus' followers, celebrated their evidences of what we are doing back to the first century AD after Jesus' death. After Jesus' death. Friends, let us gather ourselves and pray over this word tonight. I don't know if you are aware of what God is doing. I don't know if you are really aware. I don't know if you are really aware of why we keep listening to these talks again. It's like you having a precious mineral, something hidden in your home, then you going about begging for money, then an uncle relative of you tells you, hey, Patrick, hey, Mary, why are you wondering when the family has this precious thing? You train yourself to these people. They have nothing. Come home. This is what has been left for you. It's bequeathed to you by your parents, your great-grandparents. So I didn't know. But there are some who say, yeah, I know, but of what use is this gold to me? If it's there and the only thing we do is to come and look at it and as if you are worshipping the gold, we bow and you go. So, this gold is for you. Use it. 
So really, can I use it? Why not? Why can't you use the Eucharist? Why can't you use the Eucharist? It is for us. He gave it for us. He said, take this. It is an imperative. Eh? Christ didn't say, would you like to take this as my body? Please, would you like to take this as my blood? No. He broke it and said, take, this is my body. Take, this is my blood. An imperative, a command. And you are not taking. You are refuting. Let us pray to Lord, whatever is holding me from receiving that which you offer. Psalm 81 verse 10. God said he brought a vine out of Egypt to plant it. So many times he asked Israel to open up for his blessings. But my people will not open their lips so that God will fill it with his blessings. Open up and say, no, I can't open up. Open up and say, no, I can't open up. My, my weaknesses are too much. But this sacrifice was offered for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus didn't come to die for the just. The mass is not celebrated for sins. It's celebrated for sinners. It is even in this state that we must receive it. Bringing our humility, our, our weaknesses, our frailties before. Who takes medicine? and present this to a strong person who is not sick. The Eucharist, which is called Farmarco, Farmarco, sorry, Italiano, uh, medicine, medicine is given for us who are sick. God knows we are sick. Jesus knew that we are going to be sick. You can receive. Open wide your lips, Psalm 8, 1, 10, and let me feel you. It's like I can't open my, my lips. What is closing your lips? What is closing you up? The Lord who commands you to open up. First, you can ask him to command it to open. He commanded the ears of a deaf and dumb man. Ephata and the ears were opened. If the Lord commands an ear to be opened to hear, why can't the Lord command our lips to open? Why can't the Lord command our hearts to open? Why can't the Lord command our lives to open? Pray but humbly. Lord, Cause another effort to open my lips. Cause another effort. Proclaim that open, open, open my life. Proclaim that word. That word which, which you open the ears of the damp man, of the deaf and damp man who could not speak, who could not hear. Lord, that is how my life has been spiritually. No matter how prayerful, strong you are, let's present ourselves humbly in God in this way. Lord, if you permit me, I am weak like your people, but use me to proclaim effort on their behalf. And this proclamation of effort, let it also work on my behalf. So friends, in all humility, I ask for the grace of God to proclaim effort, receive it as an opening. And let this opening that works for you also work for me. Because I take the power, the grace from God to proclaim this. Not from my own power. I have no power to proclaim effort on you. Lord, in all humility, for your message today, I stand before you. I can't stand in your shoes. I humble myself in all humility. Seeking the grace to pronounce open in the lives of these beautiful souls. In every life that is locked. In every mouth that is locked. Grant me grace. Prepare me tonight to proclaim this open on your people now. Purify my tongue. Purify my lips. Liberate my lips from anything that will stop your people from inheriting the healings and the blessings that come from this pronunciation. In the name of Jesus, I proclaim, Ephata be open. In the name of Jesus, I proclaim, Ephata be open. In the name of Jesus Christ, whose precious blood runs through us who gather tonight, be opened. 
let every closed aspect of your life that is stopping you from following the command of the Lord Jesus himself to take and eat and drink be opened. Pray as well with me to end it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, if you've paid attention to what we are doing, we go back to the Old Testament to try to see elements that allude to what we do in the New Testament. I told you in one of the past sessions that in the beginning, when God created man, he gave him a charge to eat, so to live. So I said in the beginning, Genesis, God gives man something to eat to so sustain his life. In the same way in Revelations, God gives man something to eat to so sustain his life. That aspect of eating. Remember in the creation episode, before man was created, God had prepared everything before man came into the picture. This is what I'm telling you. Pay attention to these words so that you can pray as such. Before you and I came, before any single soul walking on this earth came, Christ had already changed the past, passed over into a new covenant. He taught about you. He taught about you. Christ knew you were going to fall. He taught about you. Christ knew you were weak. He taught about you. Christ knew I was weak. He taught about me. He thought about me. So he gives us a new covenant, not only in lambs, in meat and bread, but in his body, in his blood. Isn't this beautiful? The reason why he taught about us it's also beautiful in this way. In Matthew chapter 26, already we are not yet there, but he says, those of you who are here with me, you will join me in the feast to come. So there's going to be another celebration where the Lord Jesus will gather us, will gather us. In Matthew chapter 26, he says, I will not drink again until I drink in the kingdom of my God, in the kingdom of the Father. Christ Jesus, when at the Last Supper, he had given the bread and wine, which has become his body and blood to them. He says, I will not drink of this again till I drink in the kingdom. Matthew 26, 29. Look at this quotation I share with you now. This is it. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So once again, let's ask those who deny this. When Christ is saying he's going to drink from the fruit of the vine in the kingdom, is he saying that he's going to drink a suffering? In heaven, there is no suffering. What is he going to drink? It is going to be a feast. Those of us who are participating now, have you seen that Christ has already taught of us and prepared ahead for us? God who prepares before Adam comes into the scene. Christ who prepares before we come into the scene with our frailties. The same Christ prepares even before we come to the afterlife. How beautiful God is. He thinks about us. God is a billion years ahead of us. Friends, this is God. I want you to embrace this gift that which he accomplished ahead of us. And it is not only the gift in his blood, but every gift that God has accomplished has set ahead of us and you have not yet come to embrace, you have not yet seen. Because to you, it is not visible to the eyes. Pray with me tonight. Pray with me tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, not only do you give to us to eat and drink now, but you have promised to give us to drink in the afterlife. Today, these elements still remain invisible to me.
but I want to be brought to understand it. I want to be brought to receive it. It has been prepared for you. It has been prepared for me. If we remain under this banquet, if we participate in this banquet, there is no way we will be thrown out at the feast in the kingdom of the Father. You know those who are thrown out at that feast, those who are not wearing the wedding garment, those who don't come in, those who do not come in through the right door. Why should you miss this when now this has been offered for you, has been offered for your sake? Participate in it now. Participate in it now. And ask the Lord to bring you to that eternal banquet. Ask the Lord to bring you to that eternal banquet. And as you pray for this spiritual gift, pray also any other element that the Lord himself has said before you, but till tonight, remains invisible. Pray the Lord that the Lord will manifest it. You can't see the reality, but it is something you want to see. You want to appreciate. Father, my weakness is I take time. I take a very long time to embrace your promises that you have, that which you have established. Tonight, I pray. I want to see their manifestation. I want to see these realities. It doesn't mean that I doubt what you have accomplished. It doesn't mean that I do not believe what you have already done on my, on my behalf. But I pray that because of my weaknesses, I ask for their manifestation now. I ask for their manifestation now. I ask for their manifestation now. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Friends, do you know that the communion cup is a sharing, a communion, in the life of Christ. Yesterday, we, we mentioned it briefly. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 16. Pay attention. To, this morning, when I was reflecting on these things, the, 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 this, this question I was asking myself, so it's like, okay, Father, this thing you are doing, are you doing it for Christians? You are doing it for only Catholics? So, no, no, no. I'm doing it for Christians. Okay, so if uh, somebody who comes here to listen, I'm inviting a friend to come and watch and he hears you talking about this thing that Christ has done. It is they, their church, they are not celebrating it this way or they celebrate it, but they don't believe that it is the body of, and blood of Christ. It Does it mean that they are not going to heaven? No, you are not talking about inheriting heaven. You are talking about what Christ has given us for the purification of sins, for the living, for living his life, for sharing in his life. Pay attention to baptism and the Eucharist, two important sacraments. In baptism, we are immersed, we are dipped into water, into the life of Christ. I shared with you in Romans, in, 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 in the letter to the Romans. In baptism, it's like we are taken and we are put into water. We are put, we are immersed into the death and the, suff the suffering and the death of Jesus. Pay attention to the communion, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus Instead, it is he who comes into us. Take and eat, take and drink. In baptism, we are put in him. In his blood, he comes into us. This is the difference. So somebody might have received baptism. He has been immersed. He has been inserted in Jesus. But the beautiful and the greatest is Christ himself coming into us. Christ himself coming into us. Tonight, your partaking of the blood, your invitation to take and drink means that Christ is coming to dwell in you, to share in your life. Are you ready to open yourself? Come into my heart. Dear Lord Jesus, come in to stay. Come in to stay. Come in to stay. Into my heart. Into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come in today. Come in to stay. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. In our baptisms, we were put, we were immersed, we were soaked in the sufferings and death of Jesus to be risen to be raised in the covenant of his blood, Christ Jesus comes into us. What way does Christ choose? We don't know. The only thing is our availability, our humility, and our surrender. 
in the first book of Kings, chapter 8, verse 27, 28, when Solomon had built the temple and he was consecrating it to God. This was Solomon's prayer. First Kings 8, 27 to 28, verse number 28. He says, Lord, the heavens of heavens cannot contain your greatness. How much more this temple made by human hands. Solomon, by this prayer, inviting God to come to dwell in the temple, was saying, Lord, yes, I'm inviting you to come to abide, stay in this temple. But how can you, with your glory, your greatness, how can you come and live in this small temple when even the whole heavens cannot contain you? In the same way we are praying, we are saying that in the sharing of the blood of Christ, he comes to dwell in us. It's not like baptism that we go into him. He comes into us. The question is, no matter how big you are, you, no matter how tall you are, your body cannot contain Jesus Christ. Your body cannot contain even a breath when it comes. But it is the Lord Jesus himself who chooses the mode, the means in which he comes to abide in you tonight. I'm not talking about tomorrow. Tomorrow you give another prayer topic. It's tonight, today since July. Lord, I am ready. Choose ever way, whichever way you want to abide in me tonight. Lord, even the heavens cannot contain you. The temple of Jerusalem could not contain you. This body I've prepared for you. Come tonight. Come tonight. Come tonight. Of my free will, I offer my body. Come. Come, dear Jesus. 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 With that precious blood for my sake, come to nourish. Come to purify. Mix with me, dear Jesus. Come to stay. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When at the feast, the blessing of the four cups, the little child had asked the parents what they were doing. The father was to explain. So at the last supper, Jesus explains, he told them, this bread I'm giving you is my body. This one I'm giving you is my blood which will be given out for the forgiveness of sins. As in Exodus, the father will tell the child that we were slaves. We come from Abraham, we were slaves, and God brought us in much the same way Jesus in taking the body and, 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 and the, the bread and wine will tell them that by this bread and by this one which has been consecrated through them, forgiveness of sins will be given. We pray tonight, our last but one, our penultimate prayer, our penultimate prayer. We pray for those who have abandoned this way. They were once with us. They were once close to us. Doubts arise in their hearts. They have left. They have left. They have left. Ask God that wherever they find themselves now, the effects of this new covenant will fall upon them. Yes. Yes. It is for their sake this wine is given. We commit them into our hands, into the hands of the Lord. Those who are related to us by blood or by just friendship. Father, in the name of Jesus, whoever has partaken of the blood of Christ, but today finds himself away, we humbly ask the blessings you give us as Christ comes to abide in us, no matter how small these bodies are, we present to you these friends, these relations who have abandoned you and do not know where life is leading them. Move to their midst. Move to their midst. Move to their midst. Move. 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 In the name of Jesus Christ, we want to conclude this prayer tonight. Friends, I want you to join me in thanking God for all that he has done for us till now and asking that he secures our lives. 
one of the effects of the blood we will hear from the prophet Zachariah as we will link it to the book of Genesis, what the brothers of Joseph did to him is that it secures our life. That covenant was established not to be destroyed. The hey kainedia teke, the new covenant has also become the last covenant. After that, you haven't had a renewal of the covenant, unlike of old. After that, you have not had an establishment, a re-establishment of another covenant. The covenant that Jesus gave as the new has also become the last covenant. Pay attention to it. It is not only new, it is also the last because nothing has come after it. We ask the Lord that this lasting covenant will secure our lives. It's last. It is stable. There is stability. It is not stagnation. The stability of the new covenant is not stagnation. It's firmness. It's not stagnation. It's not changing. It's not stagnation. It is once and for all. It's reenactment bring us the graces. If there wouldn't be any new covenant, any new, any, any new covenant, if there is not going to be any renewal, it doesn't imply that this covenant in its blood is stagnant. No, it reveals its stability. And it is its stability that stables your life, it stables my life, granting us that stability. Our final prayer, Father, in the name of Jesus, as you've made this last and new and lasting covenant stable, in the same way, I offer my life to you on this seas day as you move into the new day. Stabilize my life, the life which Christ has come to inhabit, which Christ has come to draw. Make it stable. Make it stable. A wobbly life will mean that this life hasn't been stable. Stabilize my life for me. Stabilize my life for me. Stabilize my life for me. We have not yet moved into any prayer for healing whatsoever. But before we end this session, any aspect of your body that aches, that uneasiness, that dizziness, you are not yourself tonight, but you are still here. Pray this final prayer, although we would have ended our prayer. That uneasiness that you feel, that uneasiness, that uneasiness, speak to it, command it. Lord Jesus, you say with this exchange, this consummation, this new covenant, this exchange, I share in your life. It is not I who come to you, but you come to dwell in me. Your presence in me tonight. You cannot cohabit with this disease, with this pain, with this uneasiness. Lord Jesus, there is no way you can cohabit with this uneasiness, this pain. Wherever this pain is emanating from, wherever this uneasiness is coming from, Lord it can't cohabit with you. One must stay, one must move out. The stronger one must stay and the weaker one must move out. The more stable one must stay and the weaker one must move out. Lord, you are stronger. You are more stable. You are more powerful. Push this uneasiness away. Clear this uneasiness. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Let it move. Command it, command it with every force, every, any little energy or strength that is left in you. Command it, command it, command that uneasiness. Command it by the power and presence of the Lord who comes to abide in us tonight. And may the Lord free and restore us for the coming days. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Friends, God bless you.
Okay, so before we end, today is the birthday of our sister Audra and her friend um, Albert, who are preparing. We are we are on a journey together. So uh, we wish you congratulations, Audra. I hope now you are with um, Albert. We pray tonight. So God bless you as you celebrate your birthday today. It is also the Today has been the, the feast day of Maria Goraiti. So happy feast day to our sister Maria Goraiti. Our brother Albert and um, Audra are preparing for the holy matrimony. So we pray for them wherever they are. They've had their traditional marriage. So they are legally married. They've done the traditional. So they are married. Eh? Just preparing for the, the solemnization in church. God bless you, Edward. God bless you, Ma Cecilia. God bless you, Rita. Mary Christa, Mamiya, Rosemary, Georgina, um, Raphael, Nephi, Juliana once again. Uh, Rosemary, Lily, Ch Lily, okay. Lily, God bless you. Very eye opening. May God continue to bless your ministry. Darlene came, our sister Mary Hasford, and Benjamin Lamte. God bless you all. Same time tomorrow. We invite so many people. Today, the highest number we went to was 40. I think it would be great if during a live presentation we can hit, let's say, 50 or even 100. Invite people. Invite them. Let them hear. I know that later they can watch it. Especially talking about data these days in Ghana. It's quite expensive, but if they join us in this live presentation, it will be very beautiful. God bless you all and have a beautiful sleep tonight. May God guide us. Okay, our brother Ohina Fani join us later. Angela and Robert too. God bless you all. Amen.